in the family will not be where we are today in our christian life we've got some wisdom and yet there's still wisdom beyond the wisdom we have got now the weapon of wisdom above native wisdom and as we call upon the lord and pray it will give us the needed wisdom in jesus name let's look at ecclesiastes chapter 2 and i'm reading from verse 1 ecclesiastes chapter 2 reading from verse 1 i said in my heart go to now and i will prove thee with mercy therefore enjoy pleasure and behold this also is vanity solomon came to a period in his life after he had used native wisdom after he had requested for supernatural wisdom and he received supernatural wisdom he came to a point in his life that he wanted to look at the things of the world and taste the pleasure of the world he said he gave himself to that look at verse 3 in verse 3 it says it says i sought in my heart to give myself unto wine and also acquainting my heart with wisdom now he didn't uh, he couldn't uh, figure out supernatural wisdom native wisdom and he said i want to taste i'm going to give myself to wine i'm going to give myself to revelry i'm going to give myself to the things of the world and to lay hold on uh, on falling and he says till i might see what was the good for the sons of men which they should do under heaven all the days of their life uh, look at verse um, 9 there in verse 9 so i was great and increased more than all that were before me in jerusalem also my wisdom remained in me which wisdom is lead back to the natural wisdom the supernatural wisdom had left him because when he married all those hundreds of women god departed from him the power of god the knowledge of god the truth of god departed from him and the gift of god the wisdom supernatural departed from him but the natural wisdom remained he said he gave himself to all those things that dissipated his life that destroyed his life that cut him away from god he backslid and yet he said my wisdom remains with me and then he tells us in uh, in the next verse it says and whatsoever mine eyes desired I kept not from them I withheld not my heart from any joy for my heart rejoiced in all my labor and this was my portion of all my labor he lost self-control he lost self-denial he just gave himself to whatever pleasure and whatever work of the flesh that demanded his attention and yet he said my wisdom remains with me we shall be careful we don't fall into the trap of thinking we still have wisdom because we can gauge that and measure that and do that and oppress that and inflict punishment on others and judge in a brutal way and still think well i still have wisdom yes native wisdom you remember when solomon died and his son came to the throne they came to the son they said please your father is gone when your father was on earth he really tormented us he put the yoke upon us the load upon us and they couldn't talk because that man did it in his native wisdom but the lord is asking us that we shouldn't operate in native wisdom we should have the wisdom from above so that we can do a work for the lord that is profitable for you and profitable to god and profitable to our fellow man look at number three here number three we're looking at the wealth of wisdom higher than neighbors wisdom there are kinds of wisdom that neighbors have and neighbors have uh, natural wisdom and neighbors have human wisdom and neighbors have native wisdom but we as christians as we come to the lord the lord is asking us to come and ask him for a kind of wisdom that is higher than that of our neighbors we're looking at uh, deuteronomy chapter 4 and we're reading from verse 6 deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 6 it says keep therefore 
for and do them that's the word of god that's the commandment of god for this is your wisdom the bible this is your wisdom the commandments of god this is your wisdom the sayings of christ this is your wisdom the exhortation in the epistles this is your wisdom we have the bible we have the word of christ we have the exhortation of the lord that our neighbors do not have maybe they have the bible but they don't have the spirit of truth that will guide them into all truth we have what our neighbors do not have and the wealth of wisdom higher than our neighbors wisdom were to operate in that that's why we pray they don't have to pray anything they want to do they just recollect when this happened the other time that's the way i handled it when that happened to that man that the way he handled it all they can do is to have i mean our neighbors is to have the the natural native wisdom but we we have access to the word of god we have access to the wisdom of the scriptures and we pray and we'll preach in that kind of wisdom it says keep therefore and and do them for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations of the nation that surround you of the people that surround you which are here all these statues and say surely this great nation is a wise and uh, understanding people a wise and uh, understanding uh, people it's with that wisdom we build our lives it's with that wisdom we build the church it's with that wisdom we build our home our home our home you see all of us we have neighbors not only neighbors we have parents and we see how our parents ruled their families guided their families operated in their families and you know if you're like me you will know that the wisdom of our parents in building the home and building their household their wisdom was limited they could only refer to the proverbs of the nation or to the practices of the nation or practices of other people and most of our parents did not make it they didn't make it in the natural neighbor's wisdom but we now come and thank God we're born again thank God we're saved thank God we're children of God and thank God we have the Bible the scriptures thank God we have the spirit that helps us to understand the interpretation of the Word of God and with that wisdom higher wisdom with that wisdom, brighter wisdom, with that wisdom, deeper wisdom, revealed by the word of God, we build our lives, we build our families, we build our houses. We don't say that the way my daddy dealt with my mother, and that's what I'll do. Uh -uh, that, that one is a lower kind of wisdom. Come up, come up higher. If any of you lack wisdom, wisdom to build your home and wisdom to build your life and wisdom to build the church let him ask of God and you come asking without wavering Proverbs chapter 14 I'm reading from verse 1 in Proverbs chapter 14 verse 1 every wise woman buildeth her house every wise woman buildeth a house if you're a wife you need wisdom to build the home to build your family, to build the household. And it's not just the native wisdom. It's not just the natural wisdom. It's not the wisdom you acquired from your mom, from your dad. You need wisdom greater than that wisdom, the wisdom that comes from the Spirit of God and from the Scripture. Every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. We're looking at uh, chapter 31 of Proverbs, and we're looking at verse 26. 31 verse 26, she opened her mouth with wisdom. You're building a family, she opened her mouth with wisdom. You are a man, you're building your family, he opened his mouth with wisdom. You're building a company, you're building the workers, and you're building people that will help you project your vision achieve your vision he opened his mouth with wisdom you're building on the mission and the vision that the lord has given you a man a woman we need the wisdom from above and the way you open your mouth the way you talk and the things you say he she opened her mouth his mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness we're coming to point number two point number two we're looking at praying for wisdom 
from the Lord. If it's coming from the Lord, we need to pray. If we're asking for the wisdom from the Lord, we need to pray. That's why it says in James chapter 1, reading from verse 5. James chapter 1 verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, and we do, and we do. If any of you lack wisdom, you may not lack wisdom for human enterprise, but when it comes to spiritual enterprise, we lack wisdom. If any of you lack wisdom as a single man, single lady, maybe you have the wisdom to keep yourself, comport yourself, and go through life with all the shades and meanings of the things we go through. But when it comes to you now have a family, we need wisdom higher than the wisdom we ever had. If any of you lack wisdom, maybe as a believer, as a child of God, you live your life in righteousness and holiness before him. All the days of your life, now you become a minister. Now you become a leader. You need the wisdom you didn't have when you are just an ordinary member of the church. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, it says, But let him ask in faith, let him pray in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed. Well, we're coming to this under three subtitles. Number one, there's a search for wisdom in the world. Search for wisdom in the world. Any leader that comes up in any community, in any country, and they want to, you know, build uh, have people around them that will help them fulfill their mission, their vision, and uh, to govern very well. They look for people, they search for people that have wisdom that will support them, that will lift them up, and that will uphold the vision they have. And there is a search, and that's not just people in the world, those in the church too, the people who belong to the Lord. We search for wisdom as we live in this world. There's so many pitfalls. There's so many pitfalls. There are uh, potholes. There are so many dangers and difficulties that if we do not have the wisdom, we'll just be falling and rising, falling and rising into those situations in the world. That is how the world is. But we search for wisdom while we live in this world. Number two is the supplication for wisdom without wavering. When we come to the Lord, we know, of course, we need wisdom. Wisdom. wisdom to do what we have never done and wisdom to tread the path, the path of holiness, the path of righteousness. And we come to us knowing that the Lord will give unto us because we're making supplication for the wisdom without wavering. Number three is the supremacy of his wisdom above the worldliness. The supremacy of his wisdom above the worldliness. The worldliness are the people in the world. They may have great names. They may have exalted names. They may have the names that are very popular. They're still in the world all the same. They're worldlings. And we need wisdom supreme, higher, greater than those people who are in the world. The supremacy of his wisdom, of God's own wisdom, above the worldlings. Look at number one. Number one is the search for wisdom in the world. In uh, Job chapter 28, reading from verse 12, Job 28 verse 12, but where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Is a search, is a search. I'm searching for wisdom that I'll do all things in a way that will bring forth the desired outcome the desired fruit in every area of my life and without the wisdom from above how can I have that and now I'm searching I'm searching where shall wisdom be found and where is the place of understanding verse 13 in verse 13 man knoweth not the price thereof neither is it found in the land of the living that is in the world anywhere you search north east west south anywhere you search up there down there it says neither is it found in the land of the living obviously then this is not natural wisdom obviously then this is not native wisdom obviously then this is not our neighbor's wisdom because all those neighbors all those natural people they're in the land of the living where asking for the wisdom we're searching for the wisdom that comes from above look at verse 14 in verse 14 the depth says it is not in me 
and the sea says it is not in me but 15 in but 15 it says it cannot be gotten for gold it's not something you have enough currency to buy you can buy books you can buy tapes you can buy whatever but the wisdom is not there the kind of wisdom we're asking for you cannot buy with money and then it says not be wage eh, for the for the price thereof in verse 16 in verse 16 it says it cannot be valued with the gold of offer and with the precious onyx or the sapphire verse 17 the gold and the crystal cannot equal it and the exchange of it shall not be for jewels of gold verse 18 in verse 18 no mention shall be made of coral or of pearls or for the price of wisdom is above rubies it's above what you can earn by money what you can earn by butter by trade and butter by exchanging what you have of the currency of the world with this kind of wisdom that we're talking about you cannot buy anything from heaven with money salvation holiness righteousness wisdom and the life the new life we live you cannot buy that with any currency on earth in verse 19 it says in verse 19 the topaz of Ethiopia shall not equal it neither shall it be valued with pure gold verse 20 in verse 20 it says whence then cometh wisdom whence then cometh wisdom and where is the place of understanding look at verse 28 in verse 28 it says and unto man he said behold the fear of the Lord that is wisdom the fear of the Lord is wisdom. The fear of the Lord is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. That the kind of wisdom he wants us to have, the, the, the wisdom that fears the Lord, that believes the word of God, that knows that without salvation we're separated from God and we cannot please God. And therefore a moment, a definite day comes in your life. You make up your mind, you take a decision, you fear the Lord, you fear the word of the Lord, you fear the coming judgment, you repent of your sin and you call upon the Lord and you have a definite experience of salvation and you have the grace of God in your life that makes you now to live in his wisdom and to walk in his wisdom. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 reading from verse 22. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 reading from verse 22 for the Jew require a sign and the Greeks, the Gentiles seek after wisdom. Seek after wisdom, searching for wisdom. Verse 23. In verse 23, it tells us, but we preach Christ, Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. Verse 24. In verse 24, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ, a savior. In the wisdom of God, Christ, a sanctifier in the wisdom of God. Christ, the one that enables us to live and to walk in the fear of God, in the understanding of what he requires. Christ is the wisdom of God. Look at verse 30. In verse 30, and of, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom. Unto us wisdom. If somebody does not have Christ as Savior, Christ living on the inside of him, he might have natural wisdom, native wisdom, earthly wisdom. He does not have the wisdom that takes us to heaven. The wisdom that makes a way for us and to go through all the trials, all the temptations of the world and to get to heaven. Eventually, Christ Jesus is made unto us wisdom. And righteousness and sanctification and redemption look at number two number two here is the supplication for wisdom without wavering the supplication for wisdom without wavering it tells us in James chapter 1 verse 5 again if any of you lack wisdom now we know if we don't have Christ we lack wisdom 
Now we know if we don't have salvation, we lack a special kind of wisdom. Now we know if we do not know how to transmit and translate what we reach in the world into our heart so that our hearts are transformed, our hearts are changed, and we walk as new creatures in Christ. If we don't have the wisdom to transfer and transmit the word into our lives, we lack a real serious wisdom. And it says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. We have to have time to pray and to ask of God. Just listening to the Bible, just listening to the study, that's not enough. But we ask the Lord. Let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally. And upbraid it not, and it shall be given him. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, it says, But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven and taught. We're looking at Luke chapter 21, reading from verse 15. Luke chapter 21, verse 15. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom. I will give you. That means those disciples who had been following after the Lord, they didn't have this yet, but he said, I will give them. That means those of us who have been following the Lord, I'm saved, I'm born again, praise the Lord. I'm sure my name is in the book of life. Yes, he told them, rejoice not because the spirits are subject unto you, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven. These are the people from chapter 10. He told them their names were written in heaven. Yet he said, there's something you lack, I will give up unto you. There's something you lack, you still have to pray for. There's something you lack and you still have to seek the face of the Lord and I will give you your mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gain say or receive. We have adversaries, we have persecutors, we have the people that want to stop our journey. We have the people that want to a kind of a dilute, minimize or diminish a commitment on our way to heaven and if you do not have the wisdom beyond I am saved, I am born again you'll not be able to resist them effectively but he says as on your way to heaven and you're confronted by all these things that come against your life wanting to stop you, wanting to hinder you, wanting to diminish your commitment to get into heaven he says I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all, all of them, no exception, all of them put together, whoever they are, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gain, say, or receive. Look at number three here. Number three, the supremacy of his wisdom above the worldliness, the supremacy of his wisdom, his wisdom in us. Is wisdom flowing through us? Is wisdom operating in us? Is wisdom looking at all the things happening in the world all around you? The wisdom to still remain steadfast, solid, and stable in spite or despite all those things that may be around you. The wisdom that is supreme beyond the wisdom of the world lives. We're coming to Colossians chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 3. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In him, in Christ, is hidden all the wisdom that you can have supreme, supernatural. The treasures, the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And then in verse 8, in verse 8 it says, Beware, lest any man spoil you, beguile you, destroy you, deceive you uh, through the philosophy and the deceit, being deceived, and the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. In our lives, we'll come across, uh, you know, people, some of them, uh, they can coach the Bible like parrots. They're not born again. They're not born again. They're not children of God. They do not know how to live the victorious life, but they can quote the Bible like parrots. And they can miscoach the Bible a lot and a number of times. And if you do not have the wisdom of God, they can derail you. They can destabilize you and they can destroy the faith you have. That's why it says in Christ, we have all the treasures of wisdom. 
wisdom and all the treasures of knowledge and understanding. And you don't want people who may be able to quote the Bible. Even Satan could tell the Bible to the Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus had that supremacy of wisdom that was able to stop him, able to resist him. Not just somebody quoting the Bible, quoting the Bible. And the Bible doesn't have any kind of cleansing effect in their lives. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Christ our Savior, in Christ our Sanctifier, in Christ our Sustainer, in Christ our Baptizer, in the Holy Ghost, in Christ the one that holds us up, who is able to hold up all things in the universe, and we're kept in the power of the Spirit of God in Him, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In verse 10 it says, and ye are complete in him. You don't have to go into the depths of Satan to find wisdom. We don't have to go to the riverside to find wisdom. We don't have to go to the books of a people who deal with what he calls secret knowledge to get a wisdom. It says ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. And as you look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, reading from verse Verse 14. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, and that from a child. Thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. That's real wisdom. That's real wisdom. Wise unto salvation. What the need, what the use, what the benefit of wisdom that doesn't make somebody wise unto salvation. What's the benefit of wisdom that makes somebody wise unto hypocrisy? Wise unto covering up. Wise unto being crafty, wise unto being deceptive, wise unto pretending that he's a child of God and he's not a child of God. What's the wisdom in hiding someone and nobody will ever know? And he says, I have wisdom, I have wisdom. I can deceive without their ever telling. I can lie without their ever finding out. He has wisdom. He can remain a child of the devil without anybody ever telling that he's a child of the devil. What's, what's the wisdom in that? And what's the benefit of that? But when we have the wisdom of the scriptures that leads us to repentance, that leads us to faith in Christ, that leads us to having genuine salvation, a life-transforming salvation, and we we'll walk in that wisdom of God and we're wise unto salvation. That is the greatest kind of wisdom we can possess and operate in. He says and that from a child that was known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. We're coming to point number three. Point number three, we're looking at possessing his wisdom in our lives. It's one thing to read it in the book. Let it come to your life. It's one thing to find it in a fellow believer, in a fellow minister. Let it come into your own life. It's, it's one thing to have it in the head. Let it come to your heart and you live by that wisdom that makes you to live the life of a sick soul, the life of a purified, sanctified spirit. It tells us once again in James chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 5. James chapter 1, reading from verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. If anyone, so called a believer, if he lives a foolish life, if he lives in folly, if he lives in an unwise manner, if he speaks in an unwise manner, if he acts in an unwise manner, and obviously everybody can tell that man, the member of a church, lacks wisdom. He doesn't have the wisdom to live a consistent, victorious life. Look at this woman. 
this woman obviously she lacks wisdom she doesn't have the wisdom to live a triumphant righteous victorious life look at that pastor this pastor obviously the way he talks and the way he acts and the way he approaches people and the way he approaches problem look at this pastor he doesn't have the wisdom to live and to minister he has not prayed because it says if we pray he will give you the wisdom and he will give liberally and your bread is not if somebody has been acting like a foolish person and on why person all these past years and we're hoping that there'll be a change there'll be a transformation he'll come to a higher level of living higher level of doing things but we still find that the same foolishness of the past the same wise ways of the past is what we still find follow him to the home to the house the same foolish thing he used to do in the new year that the same thing he used to do the thing that used to cause quarrel conflict between him and the wife between her and the husband the same thing she is still doing he's still doing he has not learned that if we're going to build a home if we're going to build a church if we're going to build the kingdom with Christ we need wisdom the same old foolish thing simple thing he used to do that's what he's still doing he is not praying he may know verses of the Bible he may quote verses of the Bible he is not praying because if any of if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, it tells us, But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and toss. In Colossians chapter 4, Colossians chapter 4, reading from verse 5 walk in wisdom walk in wisdom live in wisdom act in wisdom not human wisdom not natural wisdom not earthly wisdom not native wisdom not neighbor's wisdom walk in wisdom the supreme wisdom that comes from above walk in wisdom toward them that are without he says, redeeming the time. And then in verse 6, verse 6 tells us, he says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that she may know how ye ought to answer every man. We need to possess that kind of wisdom, possessing of his wisdom in our lives. We're looking at this on the three subtitles. Number one, begin of the wisdom of the Lord for lifestyle. Number two, beware of the wisdom of the lost with looseness. Number three, behave in the wisdom of love with liberality. We're looking at number one. Number one, begin with the wisdom of the Lord for a lifestyle as we are beginning a new level of living we must begin with the wisdom of the lord that is to have salvation wisdom unto salvation if you may come into the bible study and come into the services and you're just here and then you pray pray and pray but prayer that does not relate to salvation we must begin now to pray wisely so that we have the wisdom that leads us to salvation begin any project you are going to have begin with this kind of wisdom from above pray and let the lord lead you and guide you any step you are going to take any work you are going to do any kind of behavior you are going to have any new project you are going to have begin with the wisdom of the lord for a lifestyle and what's the wisdom of the lord in job chapter 28 reading from verse 28 job chapter 28 reading from verse 28 and unto man he said behold the fear of the lord is wisdom and to depart from evil understanding if you have not been born again begin with that and understand you need to depart from evil you need to repent of every evil every sin everything that can damn your soul everything that can make you miss heaven everything that will make you that will separate you from the lord you begin by repenting of them departing from all evil that is understanding and having the fear of god who is able to kill and able to drive the soul put the soul in hell jesus said i say unto you fear him we need to have the fear of the lord in our hearts and as we begin this new life we begin with this 
his wisdom the wisdom that will help us see his face on the final day we're looking at uh, micah chapter 6 reading from verse 8 micah chapter 6 reading from verse 8 he has showed thee O man what is good and what does the lord require of thee he requires repentance he requires that we stop and think about our lives and meditate on the way the path our lives have been going and see if there be any wicked way in you to turn away from that he has shown you O oh man what is good and what does the lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly walk humbly walk humbly with thy god look at verse 9 in verse 9 the lord's voice cries unto the city and the man of wisdom shall see thy name the man of wisdom the woman of wisdom will be sober and will think and think through that I want to live my life from the beginning of this season and the beginning of the life ahead of me I want to live that in the wisdom of the Lord it says the man the woman the person of wisdom shall see thy name and hear ye the rod and who has appointed it let's look at number two here number two is the Beware of the wisdom of the lost with looseness. There are people who are lost and they lose. Their lives are loose. Their language loose. Their behavior loose. Their character loose. They're lost and they live in looseness of life. Beware of the kind of wisdom those people have. In James chapter 3, reading from verse 14. But if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. In verse 15, it says, This wisdom descendeth not from above. The wisdom that makes a person to have hatred and malice, bitterness, this wisdom cometh not from above. The wisdom that makes a person lose, frivolous, sinful, evil, carnal, backsliding, that wisdom cometh not from above. This wisdom descended not from above. The, 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 the wisdom that makes a person to hide is real feeling. It's real condemnation. And then it's able to go through life smiling and jesting. And yet there's condemnation in the heart. And it's able to cover that up. You don't want to live in that kind of wisdom that prepares you for judgment, damnation, condemnation until the final day. And you're lapping your way to hell. It says that kind of wisdom descended not from above, but is earthly, sensual devilish the wisdom that is able to pull men to yourself so that they can be defiled that they can defile you and you have the wisdom saying no matter the spiritual life of that man i'm able to you know use the wisdom you've gathered in the world and bring them to sin and lead them to hell the kind of wisdom that's devilish that's sensual and that is earthly. The kind of wisdom that's able to treat teenagers, and those teenagers are sucked in into the dungeon of immorality and evil. You know, they, they do it with their smile, with, you know, whatever they have, and the sweet, sweet things they give. That wisdom is devilish. It says, This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish look at verse 16 in verse 16 for where envy and strife is there is confusion and every evil work i pray the lord will protect us from all this kind of wisdom in the world in jesus name we're coming to number three here number three what he says behave in the wisdom of love with liberality the wisdom that makes us to behave in love, in love towards believers, loving them as Christ has loved us. That's wisdom. But the kind of life or the kind of wisdom in quotes that makes us to find every reason 
out, outside the book, why we should not love the believer as we love ourselves, the wisdom that makes people to give every excuse, why they should not love uh, the, the fellow members and uh, even their neighbors, the wisdom that makes people, you know, bring all reasons and all the excuses why they should not love because they are so wise that they say, you know, if you love, if you love, if you love, even though Christ said, how can I do that? I have the wisdom, the wisdom that makes people to contradict Christ, that they will not love and they give all the reasons and excuses outside the book why they should not love that's not wisdom that's not wisdom that's something that will destroy that soul because he contradicts christ but you behave in the wisdom of love from the lord with liberality he tells us in james chapter 3 verse 17 james chapter 3 verse 17 but the wisdom that is from above is forced pure, then peaceable, then gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Would you say in all honesty that you have prayed, you have received this kind of wisdom? Well, you need more. More challenges will come. More people will cross your way. You need more of this wisdom that is pure keeps you pure, keeps other people pure, and everybody that relates with you, they are purer than before they met you. That's the wisdom of God, that your life makes people pure, makes people purer than they were before they met you. The wisdom that makes you purer and purer and purer every day. That's wisdom. It says this wisdom from above is forced pure. That's the first thing to be noticed in the life of a person that has wisdom from above. First, you can notice that this woman, this man, this believer, this minister, this preacher, this pastor, he has wisdom today that keeps him pure, that keeps his ministry pure, that keeps everything that he does pure, and is purer than when we first knew him. That's wisdom from above. And then peaceable peaceable, the wisdom that makes us to follow peace with all men, the wisdom that makes the husband to follow peace with the wife and the wife to follow peace with the husband, the wisdom that makes the head of the house pure and peaceable with all the people working with him, living with him in the house, the wisdom that makes you peaceable with your father-in-law and your mother-in-law, that makes you peaceable with everybody around and they say he is a man of peace. He is a preacher of peace. He is a possessor of peace. He is a pastor that has a peaceful heart and he shows that in his dealing with people. He is not, you know, so, uh, uh, so kind of uh, boisterous and oppressive. He wants to oppress people. Wisdom, the wisdom of God makes us pure and peaceable. And then it says, gentle, gentle. We don't, uh, you know, behave in such an aggressive manner. He gives against anyone, you know, uh, people, innocent people, or poor people, or people you can easily intimidate. If you know, I can easily intimidate that person. You make sure you act in such a way that your action will not intimidate them or frighten them. You want to be gentle to everyone. That's the real wisdom. What's the use of the wisdom that makes the people fear you and run away from you and you intimidate everyone. Your language, your look, and your posture intimidate everyone. That's not wisdom. You see, I know how to bring them under subjection. That's not God. That's not God. That is not being gentle to all men. The wisdom we're praying about and the wisdom we want to preach in is the wisdom that makes us gentle and easy to be entreated. Not the fellow that says, I'll never forgive and no matter what they may beg from there, beg from there. Who are you? Who do you make up of yourself? A tyrant? A Nebuchadnezzar? And Herod, the person, God, you say God has forgiven you. I will never forgive them. It cancels your own forgiveness. The wisdom we have from above is the wisdom that makes us easy to be entreated and full of 
mercy. And you don't hinder other people from being merciful. There are those who feel that, you know, this fellow is too merciful, that fellow is too merciful, and they give, and they give, and they give, and then you find a kind of wisdom that will curtail them, a kind of wisdom that will cut them short, a kind of wisdom that will kind of uh, make them regret that they are being merciful. But the wisdom that comes from above is the one that looks at other people who are merciful, and they say, Lord, I pray, give me that kind of wisdom that makes me to be full of mercy and of good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. The Lord is calling us that we need more wisdom, more wisdom in our lives, in our lifestyle, in our behavior, in our interaction, in our families, in our companies, in our corporations, in the places where we work, that we have this wisdom from above. And it says, if any of us, you and I, if we lack wisdom, let's go and ask of the Lord who gives to all people liberally and he upbraideth not and it shall be given him. And it says, but let him ask in faith nothing wavering. It shall be given to us. I said it shall be given to us. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Now you know the wisdom we lack. You know the wisdom we lack and you want to ask the Lord, O oh Lord, I see this area. I lack wisdom. And I'm asking, and I'm asking in faith. And the first wisdom to ask for is the wisdom that makes you wise unto salvation. Not dodging salvation. Not dodging repentance. Not dodging, uh, seeking the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. You want to make sure you have the wisdom that makes you wise unto salvation. Wisdom that leads to repentance. Wisdom that leads to faith in Christ. Wisdom that secures the witness of the Spirit that we are a child of God. Tell the Lord, transfer everything you've heard to the heart, to the heart. Wisdom. Wisdom. And as it brings us to this level of wisdom, the wisdom for workmanship. Isn't there a work he has given you to do in your personal life? If he gave the work, you need the wisdom for the workmanship. Giving you a family, that's work, workmanship. How you build that family. How you raise that family? How you raise those children? How you build up those teenagers? Wisdom. Wisdom for workmanship. Beyond the natural wisdom that we have. Natural wisdom. Like my daddy used to demonstrate. That's not enough. Native wisdom that my mom used to exhibit, that's not enough. Neighbor's wisdom that I noticed by observation, that's not enough. You need the wisdom from God, wisdom from above, that makes you to live appropriately, adequately for what he has created you, wisdom. Tell him, if you are preaching, lower than the wisdom of your neighbors, you know you don't have enough wisdom. The believer don't even have the wisdom to keep your wife, to keep your husband. You have not asked the Lord. You have not gone to the Lord to ask. You can't have the wisdom to keep the family together. To forgive, to love, to be pure, and to keep the other one pure. You're laying all the blame on them. Why don't you come to God in prayer? And he'll give you the wisdom to work out every area of your life, starting from your family your profession, 
to the people that are walking along with you your company your place of work the wells of wisdom higher than the neighbor's wisdom you hear the people of the world they're high they're lifted up they're lofty but when you get near you see that this area of their life is lacking in wisdom so the Lord is saying look beyond those neighbors and pray for the wisdom that has sanctification in it the wisdom that fills your heart with Christ the sanctifier the wisdom that excels the wisdom of Solomon Solomon so wise he couldn't discipline the flesh And he got 700 wives, 300 concubines. And he said, And my native wisdom still so remained with me. He oppressed the people. And the people after his death came to the son. Your father laid heavy burdens on us. The more gentle with us, and the son himself had no wisdom to be gentle with the people. Said, My father whips you with weaves, I whip you with scorpions. The young man did not have the, the wisdom to lead. Do you have wisdom to lead? Pastor, preacher, minister, leader. The wisdom to lead. The wisdom of self-control, self-discipline. He tested wine, women, worldliness. And he said, yet my wisdom remained with me. What kind of wisdom? That attracted the anger of God upon his life. And yet was claiming my native natural earthly wisdom remains with me. You want to seek the Lord for the wisdom that is pure, the wisdom that is peaceable, the wisdom that is gentle, the wisdom that is easy to be entreated, the wisdom that is full of good fruits, the wisdom that is full of mercy, the wisdom that is free from partiality. The wisdom that is free from hypocrisy. If you ask, he will give you. If you seek, you will find. If you knock, he will open the door of his wisdom unto you. And in every area, that the Lord has given you to live. You will live in the wisdom from above. Wisdom in yourself, with yourself, to live wisely. Wisdom, not carnal. Wisdom, not wisdom to cover sin, wisdom to expose your sin to God and to be free from there. Not the wisdom of the philosophers, the wisdom of the people of the world, no. Great privilege, great calling to wisdom from above that makes you free 
from the foolishness and the folly of the past years. Wisdom. That makes you be aware of the wisdom of the world in their lostness, looseness. Wisdom that makes you to behave in love with liberality. Loving the brethren as Christ has loved you. Loving your neighbors as yourself. Love. Wisdom. Wisdom. Love. Pure life, pure love. Peaceable life, peaceable love. Gentle life, gentle language. Easily pardoning life. Pardoning love. Easy to be entreated. Easily forgiving. Merciful. Merciful love. Merciful life. Impartial. Impartial life. Impartial love. Sincere. Unhypocritical love. Sincere, unhypocritical love. If we ask, he will give. And he will give liberally, abundantly. All the love we need, all the wisdom we need, all the gentleness we need, all the purity we need, all the goodness, good fruits we need. All the mercifulness we need. All the impartiality we need. All the honesty, sincerity, loyalty that we need. Wisdom is wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for revealing the truth and the death of your word unto every heart. Thank you, Lord, for the invitation you have given us that we can come and ask you for the wisdom that matters, matters in life and matters in eternity. You have invited us that if we ask, you will grant unto us. Your people have asked, grant unto everyone in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray you forgive all the foolishness of our past life. Help us, Lord, to begin with this pure, peaceable life and wisdom from this moment on for the rest of our lives in Jesus' name. Let there be pure wisdom in all our personal lives, in all our families, in all our places of work, Everywhere we go, that we live in such pure, peaceable, gentle wisdom, others will want to know the Christ who lives in us. We pray, Lord, make us gentle, make us peaceable, make us full of mercy, make us easy to be entreated, easy to live with people in Jesus' name. Give us the wisdom that doesn't have any partiality that has no hypocrisy and the wisdom that makes us to do the work in proper workmanship you have given all the work you have given us in Jesus name make our lives profitable to your kingdom profitable to our neighbors make our lives so gentle so affectionate it will attract other people to the Lord Lord, we pray as you give us the wisdom, day by day, we'll be increasing in this scriptural, spiritual wisdom in Jesus' name. 
thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. in Jesus name this wisdom is given to us and it will, that wisdom will lead us and help us to be fulfilling and be fruitful in Jesus name Amen let's be seated praise the Lord today as uh, we have come together today is our Bible study Monday Bible study day, uh, which the Lord have used uh, his servants to teach us and to minister to our hearts and to reveal the secret to our lives. I pray that this secret that the Lord has revealed to us will abide with us in Jesus' name. We want to welcome whoever that is uh, coming with us for the first time maybe on the, through, on the, through the Zoom or some other medium that uh, somebody you have joined us for the first time or right here, if there's anybody, I don't know. If there's anybody that is here with us for the first time, uh, we extend the pastor's greeting to you and we pray that you will continue as God has plan to bless us and is blessing us you will also benefit in these blessings in Jesus name amen praise the Lord we ought to have other days for our meetings and the days are Friday which is for our revival service uh, revival stroke evangelism training service we also have Sunday worship service the revival, which is on Friday, is as well. Is the time is 6:20 p.m. Our Monday Bible study is as well 6:20 p.m. Exception of today's on, which we had a time some times to pray, and then start the Bible study thereafter. Other times, every Monday we come together 6:20 p.m. And on Fridays is as well 6.20 p.m. On Sundays, we have our Sunday worship service. And the time is 8.30 p.m. a.m. in the morning. So we come together and have a, pre a time of pre-worship service, time to pray and seek the face of God before the service commences at 9 a.m. Uh, exactly. I pray that God will give us grace to attend all these meetings. We also have uh, time for uh, our seniors on Wednesdays. Our seniors have evening with Jesus. That is uh, the program slated for our seniors in the on Wednesdays, and on Thursdays, children also have opportunity to gather together and have their own Bible study. The time for Bible study for the children is 6 p.m., 6 in the evening. Thereafter, the youth take over and have their own Bible studies. I pray that we, the parents, will be able to remind these children, sometimes they forget. And we ourselves will not, may, may we not forget those times as well. The teachers, their teachers have been doing very well to try to remind us, please let's be reminded to kill in these children and help them because the Bible says we should not, uh, we should help these children and uh, train them in the way they should go. And when they grow up, they will not forsake and they will not uh, depart from that way. So, kill your child in.
help them to sit down, remind them that it's a time, very serious time, to learn from the feet, uh, at the feet of the Lord through their teachers. Praise the Lord. We have some other programs that is, that is coming up this month. The youth of next month, our children will be having their, 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 their own opportunity, their own time is, uh, to, have, to lead a church throughout uh, the, the Sunday we'll be having, or they will be having. So let's pray for them. Let's ask God to help them, to strengthen them, even their teachers as well, that God will help their teachers. Next month, the, teach, uh, the children, as I said earlier, the children will be having a Sunday, particular one Sunday, as the youth just had uh, last Sunday. Children will be having, let's pray for them, that God will help them. And there is also a program, program that is uh, coming up for the youth July, every uh, youth is expected to register and attend this program. Parents, please encourage. Of course, our children don't have their own money, so it's our responsibility to register them and uh, also remind them that they're attending this program. I pray you will not allow your child to stay home uh, while the program will be going on. And the venue for the program is at North Carolina. And some other programs like that. Pray that God will help. Every of these programs, some of them are, are being, we are being reminded through our WhatsApp uh, 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 handle. So I pray that you look it up there and see every of these that is necessary for you to uh, pay attention to and act accordingly. Praise the Lord. We are going to, right now, take our offering. You have come to the presence of the Lord. God expects us to bring some offering from the many that God has blessed you. So keep your hands in your pocket. Let's give an offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Gracious, mighty God, we bless your name. We thank you, Father, for your goodness towards us. If, these, if we were to pay for these programs we've been attending, the Bible study, the Sunday worship, that is enriching our lives, that is helping us to be better off than ever, if we were to pay for each and every one of them, we may not have been able. If we were to pay for life, no one will be able to do that. But, oh God, you have given us everything freely. And Father Lord, we thank you so much this evening, we have come to your house of God with tokens in our hands, and we pray that you receive it, O Lord. Those that have nothing to give now, I pray that next time that we gather, Lord, that you give the opportunity, give them the opportunity, and give them the substance to be able to offer, O God, to the storehouse. Take all the glory, Lord. Thank you, Father, for your answer. We lift up your holy name. We exalt you, Lord. We know you have done it again. Thank you for answer, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hold on, um, the usher is coming.
praise the Lord. In case you intended, you have you intended to give and you are not here physically with us, there are some other ways, some other means to, for you to offer, to give your offering. There is a, a Zelle number that is right there, which you can sell your money to the church. The number is right there uh, on the screen. Or you have a check to, to you to, you can write it to the church and come with it next time that you have opportunity to come to the church physically. Praise the Lord. We have come to the end of the service, but before we go, we leave, we want to share the grace. Let's rise up and share the grace together. The grace, want to go. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Him, surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We have come to the end of the service. I don't know if the pastor has something to tell us. Nothing. Okay. Praise the Lord.
Praise the Lord. We welcome you to the Bible study tonight. And I pray we'll have a wonderful time together in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Bible study. Thank you for your people. Thank you for fathers, mothers, children, boys and girls. Thank you for everyone, Lord. Thank you for the interest you have given us to study with you, to hear your word, and to hear the declarations you have made concerning the end time events. We are asking, Lord, that tonight you open our eyes of understanding and you give us the heart to take in, the heart to receive, and the heart and the mind to be prepared to do your will, so we'll be ready for the coming of the Lord in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. As you know, we've been studying from Mark chapter 13. And the answer of the Lord Jesus Christ, which eventually has now revealed to us the event, events of the last days, that answer came as a result of the question that the disciples had asked. Actually, the Lord Jesus Christ had been talking to them about his days. He has spoken to them about his resurrection. And he has spoken recently to them about the destruction of the temple. And he said, no stone will be left upon another. They will see everything collapsing. Everything will totally crumble and come down. And then he spoke about his coming again. And spoke about the end of the world. I've told you already that that came as a surprise to them. And so now they came to ask the question privately, intimately, when he was alone with his own disciples. Outsiders were not there. Pharisees were not there. Sadducees were not there. These were the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ who wanted to know. And he said, tell us, when shall these things be? And when will be the end of the world and the sign of your coming? And that's what we have been looking at in the various uh, parts of the answer that he gave to them. Today we're looking at Mark chapter 13, verse 14, all through to verse 23. And today the Lord mentioned himself, the great tribulation. And we're looking at Christ's infallible prophecy of the great tribulation. Number one, it's a prophecy. It's something that has not happened. It's something that will happen. And because it will happen, that's why it is prophecy. It is infallible because it is unchangeable. It is, not, it is something that nothing can change. No man and no power, no evil, no Satan. And even God will not change this. It's a time that will come. That's why it's called the infallible prophecy and it is from Christ and he is the personification of the truth. He told the truth, he said the truth and now let us look at uh, this passage where studying from verse 14 to verse 23 at the beginning I'll just select some verses for us to read. Look at verse 14 now. It says in verse 14, but when he shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand, standing where it ought not to stand, let him that readeth understand. Then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. The Lord Jesus Christ had brought the prophecy of the past that Daniel spoke about this. He said, Daniel the prophet, he spoke about the abomination of desolation. And he said, when you see the people who live in the world at that time, when they shall see, it says, he that readeth, let him understand. He that treated, that means it's, it, it's not just the disciples. He that will read about this, 
he that readeth what we're learning now, let him take note and let him know that that time is very near. I'm reading from verse 19 now. In verse 19, as Jesus con uh, continued, he said, For in those days, he's talking about the days of the affliction, the days of the great tribulation, the days that are still coming. For in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which, the, which God created until this time. Neither shall be. It talks about the affliction, it talks about the suffering, and it talks about the great tribulation that is to come. And there's something peculiar about that great tribulation. It is something that had never been such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created until this time. And then he said, neither shall be. That means that it will happen, it will be the height of suffering and the height of pain and the height of sorrows and the height of affliction. And that's what we are talking about, Christ's infallible prophecy of the great tribulation. Today we're dividing the message to three parts. Uh, number one is the abomination of desolation after the glorious translation. You understand? There's going to be a, tr a glorious translation. Translation means the Lord is going to catch us away. He's going to take us away. The, the term for that, technical term for that, is the rapture. But the rapture is the glorious translation and the abomination of desolation that will happen. Notice this word, after, after, after the glorious translation. Point number two, the affliction beyond description during the great tribulation. After the rapture has taken place, after the glorious translation has taken place, after the saints, after the church has gone, after the bride of Christ has been removed from this world, that's the glorious translation, after the ambassadors of Christ have been taken away from this world, that's the glorious translation, then there will be the great tribulation. That great tribulation will be a time of affliction beyond description, beyond what had ever happened and what will ever happen. Point number two, the affliction beyond description during the great tribulation. Point number three now is the activity of deceivers for the great tyrants. During the great tribulation, a tyrant a king of a wicked personality will arise. It's called the Antichrist. And there will be deceivers, there will be seducers, there will be people that will be prophesying and walking this and walking that by the power of the devil. And that devil, that Satan, that Antichrist is referred to now as the great tyrant. And the activities of those uh, people that will be working for him is point number three, the activity of deceivers for the great tyrant. Let's come back to number one. In point number one, this is the abomination of desolation after the glorious translation. The abomination of desolation after the glorious translation. Now, we need to think very well in a logical way, systematic way, scriptural way. And we're talking, number one, about the ascension. Ascension is when something goes up, when someone goes up. Like when Jesus Christ was talking to his disciples, and then he was lifted up, and he went up. We call that the ascension of Christ. That ascension is going to happen to the old church, to the church of the saints of God. That's the rapture. That's the rapture of the catching away, the taking up of the children of God, of the saints of God, the ascension that will happen before the devastation. Number two, then we'll see in this section the abomination of desolation. Then we'll see number three, the admonition for escaping damnation. Why are we studying? Why are we here? Why are you reading your Bible? Why are you studying your Bible? Why do we want to know about the things that Christ has said? So that we'll escape. 
and so that will not be part of the people that will suffer in the great tribulation when that great tribulation will take place. That's why we need to, as we're talking about the rapture, you want to take part in the rapture. As we're talking about the abomination, you just want to be enlightened so that when that desolation, damnation will come upon this world, you will escape. Thank God you are going to escape. Saved, you will escape. Sanctified, you will escape. And standing steadfast in the will of God, in the mind of God, you will escape in Jesus in the admonition for escaping damnation. And let's run through very quickly. Number one, the ascension before the devastation. As you look at Luke chapter 21, here is what Jesus Christ told his own disciples, and here is what Jesus Christ is telling us. In Luke chapter 21, reading from verse 34, he said, Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with self-eating. And look at what the Lord is saying. He said, As you hear about the events that will come, about the things that will happen at the end of this world, don't just shrug your shoulders and just say, Okay, whatever will happen, will happen. If uh, trouble is coming, tribulation is coming, if suffering is coming, affliction is coming, then what will happen? Well, happen. It says, no, don't have that nonchalant attitude. You must take it yourself, lest at any time your heart be overcharged with submitting and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that they come upon you unawares. There will be people who just carry on life. Uh, you know, they don't understand that rapture is going to happen. They are not waiting for anything. They are not careful about anything. They are not praying specifically. And they are not preparing themselves specifically. And they are not standing firm in the conviction that they are waiting for the coming of the Lord. And the Lord is saying, don't do that. Don't be nonchalant and don't be careless. Take heed unto yourself. Look at verse 35 of that uh, Luke chapter 21 it says for as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the earth this is not a localized thing that will happen the desolation that will come the devastation that will come the destruction that will come is not a localized thing it will come like a snare suddenly upon all them that dwell on the face of the earth but the Lord has told us in verse 36, in verse 36 it says, Watch ye therefore, because many people will be unprepared, because many people will not be ready. It says, You, my child, you, my servant, it says, Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and then to stand before the Son of Man. The rapture is going to take place before the devastation, before the abomination, before the rule of the Antichrist. It is very interesting. Look at Luke chapter 17, verse 29. In Luke chapter 17, verse 29, the Lord says, like it happened at the time of Lord, it says that same day that Lord went out of Sodom, that same day that Lord went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Please understand, Lord went out of Sodom before the fire of God's wrath and God's judgment came upon Sodom. The church will leave this place. The church will leave the earth, will be translated, will be raptured, will be cut up, will be taken away before the Antichrist will come to rule over the world here. The Lord will not allow the Antichrist to rule over his bride. You understand? The Lord will not allow that devastation to come while his ambassadors are still here, while the church is still here. And it says, the same day that Lord went out of Sodom, and it's after that it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them. Look at verse 30 and look at what the Lord is saying. It says, even thus, even in the same way shall it be in the day that the Son of Man is revealed. It's very clear then that the rapture will take place before the devastation. 
If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 51, it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. It says, We shall not all die. We shall not all be in the grave. We shall not all be resting in the grave, but we shall all be changed. In verse 52, it, it says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, that for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised in corruption. That's the time of the rapture. There will be a resurrection. And then the rapture now. And we shall be changed. We've read this before. Just to refresh your memory in First Thessalonians chapter 4. Reading from verse 14. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Reading from verse 14. It says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we believe that, don't you? That's how you were saved. You believe that Jesus Christ died for you and that he rose again for your salvation, for your justification. And because we believe that, that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which live in Jesus will God bring with him. He is coming. And it says the Lord Almighty God will bring with him the people that sleep in the dust. Look at verse 15. It says, verse 15, for we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive, believers, saints, children of God, saved and sanctified, holy and ready for the coming of the Lord, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we.